Well, the hot stove is heating up, but could it be the biggest move in the offseason is coming from Baltimore? You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, baseball fans. Welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, there's my lower third. You can call me Sully. I'm an Emmy-nominated television producer who's been a baseball podcaster for well over a decade now, and I finished my fifth season. I'm looking forward to my sixth here at the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. If you're listening to our show every day and you want to comment on social media, we're at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter or whatever it's called now, and on Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Thanks so much for making us your first listen every day. And if you're an everyday listener, be sure if you're going to post somewhere, use that hashtag, Everyday Sully. Hey, uh, let's quickly talk about the trivia question that I gave the other day. And I scoured all the answers, and I didn't see a correct one. The question was, who was the last New York Yankee to throw a complete game in the postseason? Now, we got a couple of good guesses. Um, My buddy Marcel in Switzerland uh, he said, I don't know the answer, but my immediate reaction to trivia question was David Cohn. Not a bad guess at all. We got a couple of Pettits. We got a couple of uh, uh, Adam Scott Bristol says, I'm thinking Clemens. Clemens did throw a complete game victory in the 2001 postseason, but alas, not the last one. The last one was thrown by, drumroll please, CC Sabathia. CC Sabathia threw a complete game victory to clinch the 2012 division series for the Yankees. By the way, uh, when they write the history of the division series, 2012 was probably the greatest division series where all four were thrillers. All four had come from behind victories. That was the greatest division series we ever had. So naturally, the World Series ended with a sweep. So nobody got it. Nobody got it. No soup for you. Um, look, at there's not a lot on the the hot stove situation after you know a couple of blockbusters we had, especially the the Juan Soto move. Um, by the way, uh, I'm going to cross pollinate here a little bit, but please listen to Locked On Yankees with our great friend Stacy Gatsoulias, who was on the show a couple of days ago, and her producer Steve Granado. They had as a guest Michael K who is one of the main voices and the main television voice of the New York Yankees. And they had a fabulous interview. It's a fantastic episode. Um, There's not much to to point to in terms of player moves on this day. Um, Victor Caratini signed with Houston. um, And you saw that uh, uh, Candelario wound up signing with Cincinnati. I thought that was an interesting move. And the Orioles signed Craig Kimbrell. There's a lot of depth in that bullpen that they have. So I don't think they're going to ask Kimbrell to be the closer, and I don't think you should have him be the closer at this point. Look, at Kimbrell's had a wonderful career, you know, and he's had a longer career than most closers have, but I wouldn't trust him in the ninth inning. I think we all saw why. But that's not the big news in Baltimore. And oddly, the big news in Baltimore is not anything except a story that emerged in a Bloomberg uh, article, and by the way, cross-pollinating again, uh, listen to Connor Newcomb, who did a fantastic episode doing a deep dive on this topic for the Baltimore Orioles. Well, let's do a, just a quick recap here of what's going on. Um, something called the Carlisle Group, which I assume is one of those companies when you see a James Bond film, uh, the, the, the villain has a cover corporation to mask the destruction that they're secretly planning. I believe that's what the Carlisle Group is. 
It is a front for a world domination society. And no doubt a man by the name of David Rubenstein, I don't know if it's Rubenstein or Rubenstein at this point, will know soon. Uh, he's probably a Bond villain. I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that he could be a Bond villain that could save the Baltimore Orioles. He is a billionaire, and who knows what happens with billionaires behind closed doors. But he has strong ties to the Beltway area. He has strong ties to Baltimore and is a billionaire, is swimming in money that I can't comprehend, and is in talks to acquire the Baltimore Orioles. Now, as the Gillian Tan story on Bloomberg says, we're not sure how far along we are at this point. You know, we're not sure if this is kicking the tires. We aren't sure if this is going to be, you know, a, a big, huge event or whatnot. But here's one thing that is refreshing. The Orioles have been run into the ground by the Angelos family. The Angelos family has had control of the team, I believe it's been since the late 80s. Now, Camden Yards was built on their watch. The Cal Ripken game was happened on their watch. And they've had some pockets of good years, including this year where they were a 100-win team. But there's also been a tremendous amount of strife. Peter Angelos, the owner, is in his mid-90s. He is he's infirm at this point. And he has passed it along as what happens so many times in the sports team to say, my sons can run it. And that's almost never a good idea. I think you can count the times that turn out to be a good idea on your hand. And so the, the nitwit sons have been not running the team well, and they wound up suing each other. And there's all these other things. And there's strange television contracts that have them tied up with the, the the Nationals hate the Orioles, the Orioles hate the Nationals because of the television content they have to share. And oddly, the, there's the, the, the rumors about Camden Yards, you know, the great jewel of the, the ballpark that began the ballpark revolution. Uh, is that going to be abandoned? Are the Orioles going to move? And they had a giant press conference earlier this year about how they're going to stay and everything. But if you actually listen to what was said, and there was nothing binding. It was just a get people off their back situation. And they have terrible, terrible public relations. Orioles fans hate them. And the Orioles are one of the lowest paid teams. Now, look, at I know Baltimore isn't as big a, a market as New York, Boston, Chicago. But I'm sorry. The Orioles, an East Coast team with fans all across the country should have at least the financial wherewithal to rise above the bottom five in payroll. And I've talked long and long, and I've, and one of the reasons I've talked long and long is that I am correct that the management not wanting to go for it in a year where the Red Sox and the Yankees were not going to be in the picture was a catastrophic mistake that will only be remedied when they eventually win the World Series. And part of it, when I would bring it up, was, well, the Angelos family this, the Angelos family that. When you have ownership, which at the top is stymieing the team, the worst case scenario is something what's happening with the Angels. Artie Moreno this, Artie Moreno that. They have the two greatest players of their generation as teammates and forget the World Series, they can't reach 500. The Orioles win 100 games, have a, a, a plethora of terrific prospects, and they're in that point where they were bad, 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 drafting big, drafting big, drafting big. They're in that point when the Astros tore apart their team and rebuilt and they started to win. When the Cubs tore the team apart and they rebuilt and they started to win. That's the point where the Orioles are. They've had their 100 lost seasons. Now they're starting to win, and they've got to be able to go for it because you don't know where that window of opportunity will be. We saw the Cubs pull off the championship. We saw the Astros put an asterisk as to the championship but go on the great run. This is the Orioles' time. But the thing that you could see in the eyes of all Oriole fans is – Basically, what's the point? 
with this ownership, how are we going to win? Which brings us to why this is such potentially great news. That if you change the thing that's wrong with the team, maybe, just maybe, there's some hope for the future. Hey, let's talk a little bit about the number one sports book in America. That's FanDuel. The weather's getting a little colder, even here in Southern California. And the NFL offers to stay hot via FanDuel. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 Moneyline bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel is an official partner of the National Football League. Hey, here's a quick reminder. Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows like this one, covering every league. So go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Now, I have to say one thing before I go on. One of my commenters is one of my new favorite listeners, and it is my friend from Down Under, Mosef, put on this comment on the YouTube, said, new drinking game. Have a drink every time Sully says, look it. Guaranteed you'll be drunk before the show ends. Now look it, Mos F. I didn't even realize I did it. But look it, if I do it, uh, I do it. It's a, maybe it's a tick. And look it, if you're going to drink every time I say, look it, look it, I can't stop you from drinking. Now look it, if you're drunk already, look it, that's your choice. Look it, look it, look it, look it, look it, look it, look it. Drink, 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 drink. Let's get back to the Orioles. Now, I, as I said, I don't know anything about this fella, but it does seem that he has deep pockets. It does seem that David Rubenstein has connections to improvement of Baltimore. And he seems to be the type of person who might change the culture. And that's what the Orioles need. The Orioles are one of the great sleeping giants of baseball fandom. You know, people talk about Boston as if it's Los Angeles or Chicago or New York in terms of a giant metropolis. It's not. It's a good-sized city, but it's got a great region that has followed the baseball since, I don't know, since Miles Standish landed on Cape Cod. But Baltimore has deep roots, deeper than the Nationals, and they can stretch out into other parts of Maryland, West Virginia. Even there are people who grew up around Washington who all grew up big Oriole fans when I was growing up. Yes, the Nationals encroached on it, and yes, the Nationals won a World Series recently. But the Nationals stink now, and their deep roots are some of the great moments in Oriole history that go back you know, a long time ago now. But for a team that hasn't won a World Series or even been in the World Series since Ronald Reagan was president, there are deep roots in that fandom. And I think that they will absolutely go bananas if not only they put a good product on the field, they already have done that, they're a 100-win team, but have a sense that ownership has their back. Have a sense that something's different. You saw the great relief that's happened with the Mets, even though they haven't won anything yet. You know, they've won, they've gone to the playoffs once in this new regime, but you get the sense that the new ownership isn't going to be the Will Ponds. You saw it down the street in Los Angeles when the McCourts let go of the team and the new ownership group took over. Now, obviously, they've had this great huge run, but the sigh of relief when the ownership changes over. Look at, I th oh, take, take a shot. This could be exactly what Baltimore fans need. Just that mentality that things could be different. Now, there's all sorts of things, in, and Connor Newcomb covered it. There are tax reasons 
why they won't sell well until you know Peter Angelos passes away. There's there's things all intertwined with the the TV contract. It's not as simple as putting the team out on Craigslist. But if there is the possibility of it turning over to a new group, do you know what? That could be a fan base that could absolutely explode. Now, this weekend, uh, I have to be on the lookout because at any moment, Shohei Otani is going to sign somewhere. Now, there's a lot of rumors that maybe the Giants are getting in on it. The Blue Jays certainly are going full blast. It's looking less and less like my initial prediction is going to come true. My initial prediction was Otani was going to sign a short-term deal, a two-year deal, and I thought he was going to go to the Cubbies. He was going to show a short-term deal, easy for you to say, where he gets to reestablish himself as a pitcher. However, it didn't. it's looking more and more like teams are just going to be throwing money at him. He's like, ah, forget it. I'm going to make half a billion dollars anyway. Who cares? Let's just sign the big deal. Also knowing full well that he could get injured again. You know, he's already injured his pitching. What if he got hurt as a batter and suddenly he can't go out and sign the $500 million contract? I think he's going to sign the deal. It's looking more... I think whenever he signs a long-term deal, and even when I was saying he, if he signed a two-year deal with the Cubbies, he was going to sign a long-term deal with LA, I think he's coming to the Dodgers. I think that, I think that, I think that. That's my main prediction with him now my predictions tend to be wrong but um sure the giants could put in a huge overpay that's a distinct possibility or toronto could say we need the star power what are you going to do these are all possibilities i think he's going to sign a long term deal it's going to be with the la dodgers and then you just have to take a look at what's happened with the angels and think what could have been absolutely what could have been but we'll keep an eye out for that because you know what? It's going to make this weekend a lot more interesting. Once again, a reminder that Lockdown has launched the first ever National Sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. Lockdown Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top stories of the day with the local experts of Lockdown, plus our national shows covering Every league, go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe to the first national sports 24-7 streaming channel. Okay, let me tell you what I'm going to do right now. It is Friday. We do What If Fridays. We do that all winter long. But as I was coming up with our, my What If for this week, I realized I already did one that I'm sure most of you didn't see. I did an episode over the summer when Paul Holden had to take some time off. I filled in and did a week of shows for Locked On Rockies. And on one of the episodes of Locked On Rockies, I did what I personally felt was a really intriguing what if involving Denver baseball. And I decided instead of recreating it, why don't I just play that clip? Heck, it's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I recorded this actually in my mother's house in Palo Alto. So you're going to see a different background here. But here's me talking about one of the most intriguing what ifs the what ifs regarding denver baseball in the 1980s i love to think about the alternate universes the things that almost happened trades that almost happened team moves that almost happened managerial changes that almost happened stadium moves that almost happened that i find those to be extraordinarily interesting because well the the foundation of baseball is so the history of baseball in so many ways is so fragile and could bounce this way or the other that it, it makes looking at baseball history to me truly interesting because so many things that we take for granted almost were completely different. The, you know, the move of the Dodgers to Los Angeles almost didn't happen. The Senators almost moved to Los Angeles. You know, teams, team moves almost happened. Babe Ruth was almost signed by the in New York Giants. Roberto Clemente was in the Dodgers organization. And if they had handled him differently, he would have been a great Dodgers star. All these different things. And I'm thinking about Denver baseball. 
Now, for years and years and years and years, it was very clear that Denver was a prime place to put a Major League Baseball team, more so than a lot of other places that have had expansion teams or teams moved to them. One of the reasons is a lot of times you see in some of the cities where they put teams, and I'm looking at Miami, I'm looking at Phoenix, some of those places you have large populations, but have populations that are relatively new or filled with lots of people who have um, recently moved there, transplanted from other places in the country. Denver and Colorado has a really entrenched population of sports fans and a population that really identifies with Colorado. Denver is a tremendous sports city. And I know this through my, I have many, many relatives who grew up in Colorado and the, the, the love of the, uh, you know, especially the Broncos runs deep. It's not filled with a lot of people saying, oh, I live in Denver, but I'm still a Patriot fan. Or I'm still a Giant fan. Hell, I live in California and I'm a native New Englander. And my loyalty still is with the Red Sox, even though I haven't lived in Massachusetts since Ronald Reagan was the president. So Denver always has been a place that people have had their eye on. In fact, you can go back to there was a proposed third major league in the early 1960s called the Continental League. Branch Rickey was going to be the commissioner of it. And they proposed teams in Houston and Toronto and Denver and several other markets, all of which eventually got a major league franchise of their own. In fact, only one of their potential markets never got a team, which was Buffalo. But the possible emergence of this league caused Major League Baseball to panic and forced the first expansion in first 1961 and 1962. Oddly, Denver was not in either one of those expansions, nor were they in the expansion of 69, nor were they in the expansion of 77. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. The Rockies became part of the expansion of that took place before the 1993 season, where they finally got their long-awaited four team along with Miami, with the Florida Marlins. And one of the things that made it clear that they had to put a team there was you had a stadium. You had Mile High Stadium. It's very hard to, to expand or move a team in baseball because there are not a lot of stadiums ready for baseball that just sitting there empty. There happened to be two back in the early 90s, Joe Robbie Stadium and Mile High Stadium, so the Marlins and Rockies were no-brainers. But Mile High was there for a while and was the home of the Zephyrs for a while. And they almost got a team... Well, two times they almost got a team. And if these two times worked out, man, oh, man, would baseball history have been different. The first time that it really got to the point where I had baseball books that I read when I was a kid in the late 1970s that mentioned this potential move, and that was the A's. Charlie Finley was the owner of the A's when he, they were in Kansas City, and he tried to move them any, to any city within creation. Louisville, Atlanta, Dallas, eventually moved them to Oakland, which may have been the worst possible place he could have put them. He probably should have put them in San Diego. I digress. And then they won the they won five straight division titles, three straight World Series, but then chaos began. And Finley began to panic with the outset of free agency, start selling off all of his players. But here's the thing people forget. He sold off his players, got a big pile of money, and then started developing another pretty darn good team. Yeah, they lost 100-some-odd games, but the talent that was brewing in that farm system was off the charts, and he was getting ready to move. In fact, deals were being made to send the A's to Denver. The Denver A's would have been there starting in 1980. And that would have included a young player who was a rookie the final season in Oakland named Ricky Henderson. The team had a lot of young talent on the team, like Mike Norris, like Tony Armas, who both went on to become multiple all-stars. But they had Ricky Henderson, one of the five greatest offensive players in the history of baseball. I will say that with no compunction. And Ricky Henderson would have come to Denver in his prime. This is 130 stolen base, Ricky Henderson, with some high altitude to go along with it because he was already a 20 some odd home run person as well. Could you imagine Ricky in Denver? How beloved he would have been in Denver. 
the records he would have set in Denver. It's unbelievable. I made a calculation, and I, I'm, I don't remember the exact one, but it was something like if someone stole 50 or 60 bases a year for 21 straight years, Ricky Henderson would still have the stolen base record of all time. That's what we could have had in Mile High Stadium. But lots of panic took place in Oakland because they were on the verge of losing the Raiders to Los Angeles. They didn't want to lose everybody, unlike now. And the A's wound up staying in Oakland, owned by the Haas family, setting up the new, setting up Billy Martin, eventually setting up the Bash Brothers. No team yet in Oakland. Then the Pirates. The Pirates, despite also winning multiple championships in the 1970s, being a model franchise in the 1970s, started falling apart in the 80s. They fell in the standings. And the embarrassing cocaine trials were happening in Pittsburgh. The team was falling apart. They were playing in three river stadium where they couldn't draw flies. And sitting was this market that everyone knew was going to be a success in Denver. And the Pirates tried to work out a deal to move the team to Denver in the mid-1980s. And like those A's, that Pirate team had a generational talent. Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds, skinny Barry Bonds, base-stealing Barry Bonds, fast defensive whiz Barry Bonds, one of the greatest talents in baseball history, Barry Bonds, would have come and flourished and reached his peak in Denver, in thin air, pre-humidor, Remember when Larry Walker and Andres Galarraga and Dante Bichette and all of them were mashing those home runs? Imagine Bonds doing that. That would have happened in Mile High Stadium. Around the same time John Elway was fighting his way in the Super Bowl, you would have had the Denver Pirates with Bonds in the middle of it. Now, would he have eventually have gone off to free agency like he did with the Pittsburgh Pirates? Maybe. But you would have also have had that beautiful prime in Mile High Stadium. Sadly, both of those realities never took place. The Pirates wound up getting a beautiful ballpark. And the A's, well, maybe they're going to Vegas. We don't know. They didn't go to Denver. Denver got the Rockies instead. And no one's complaining. But man, you could have had Ricky Henderson or Barry Bonds in their prime in Mile High Stadium. All right, so that was a little bit of our discussion regarding the what-ifs with the Denver baseball. It's intriguing. That's the whole idea of what-ifs. They are always intriguing. Hey, um, thanks for watching today's show. Uh, follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. And if you listen to us every single day, make sure to put on that hashtag Everyday Sully. And let's do the trivia question. We talked a little bit about Denver baseball. Well, Denver was a minor league team for many, many, many years until the Rockies showed up. What team was the last team to have a AAA affiliate in Denver? Which franchise was the last one to have Denver be a minor league city that they sent their players to? Put the answers down here on YouTube or at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter, on Instagram, or at Sully Baseball on Twitter, or Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'm going to be in Shohei Otani Watch. This has been Locked On MLB. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.